this March session of AWE, Aging with Expectation, with uh, Dr. Francis McNabb and Dr. Stephen Kosky. The topic today is hope. I think it's a great topic. And without any further ado, I'll go straight over to Stephen to kick us off. Thanks so much, Graham. Uh, it's great to, great to see you and great to be able to have this opportunity to continue the conversation. I'm, I'm here with my absolute favorite coffee cup, just <laughs> pretending, pretending I'm in Melbourne, um, even though I'm in Oregon, uh, a, few, a few miles and a few hours away. Um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about hope today. I was kiddingly saying that uh, I'm not feeling very optimistic at the moment. And uh, someone once wrote that hope is the place you go to when your optimism fails. I love that quote by Nelson Mandela that says, uh, may your choices each day reflect your hope and not your fears. And I actually think hope plays a really, I think it plays an important part in meeting the challenges that we face every day. So I thought we'd talk about hope. Where do we find it? What is it? And what does it mean to choose hope as you age? I don't know if you remember Francis William Sloan Coffin, yes. you know, the famous preacher at, at Riverside. Yes. He said, hope, hope is a state of mind. It's actually an orientation of the heart. And that hope is actually independent of the state of the world or the circumstances of your life. And he went on to say that a, a heart full of hope is able to keep you going, <laughs> even when you've run out of things to be, uh, to be optimistic about. It's hope that allows you, he said, to hang on to your faith, despite the evidence in the world that suggests it's foolish to hope. And he said, it's only hope that has the power to change that evidence. So to get this conversation going, I think what he's really suggesting to us, which I think most people don't realize, is that hope isn't a feeling. It's actually a decision. It's a choice. So I wanna share a story to, uh, to kick this off. Um, it's Bosnia in 1992. And Vidran Smelovic was a Bosnian born in Sarajevo, and he was the principal cellist of the prestigious Sarajevo Opera Theater. But in 1992, the Opera Theater lay destroyed. The economy was shattered. National unity was disintegrated. Ethnic cleansing flourished. I mean, there was no bleaker, divided, more violent place on earth than Bosnia in 1992, Vidrin described Sarajevo as the, as the capital of hell at that time. So it's 4 p.m. on May 17th, 1992, a long, a long line of starving people are in front of the only bakery and they were shelled. 22 people died. The next day, the very next day, starving people lined up again for bread because it was the only bakery. And they were certain they would die of starvation if they didn't get bread. And they feared they would die standing in that line from shelling. You know, I think that's what hopelessness looks like. But then it happened. <laughs> Vidran arrived. Vidran Smelovic, dressed in the black suit and the white tie that he wore every single night before the opera theater was destroyed. And he was carrying his cello in a chair. And he sat down amidst the ruins of the square, surrounded by the reminders of death, surrounded by the, the, the despair of the living, and he sat down amidst all of that 
and he began to play his cello. And he returned to that square every single day to play his cello, whether there was shelling or violence or not, for 21 consecutive days, one day for each person that was killed in that bread line. I like to say that he sat in that square as an expression of what I call defiant hope. A reminder, I guess, of the resiliency of the human spirit. And today, there's actually a monument that stands in that square, that same square, of a man in a chair playing his cello. And the monument, as great as his music was, the monument isn't actually there in tribute to his music. But it's a tribute, I think, to hope. The hope that violence and, and suffering will never have the last word. The hope that beauty, music, can be reborn in even the midst of a living hell. So in one of your books, Francis, in one of your books, you offered this prayer. May we be carriers of a strong spirit and a good hope for ourselves and the world. And I love the words that, that you wrote that invite people into, into Mingri the quiet place, that place where people can escape from the trauma they've experienced in life and recover hope. And you wrote, Mingri is here to bring quietness and hope to unsettled and troubled times. In silence, in the silence, there is strength and there is healing. Those are hopeful words. So what do you think about hope? What do you think about hope? What do you think of the role that hope plays in our well-being? Yes, hello. Hope is a, is a unique combination of mind and emotion, of mind and spirit. We need our mind to think, hope, think a new start, think of a new beginning. We need the mind to work. But the mind works even better when we've got a good emotion being born, emotion and spirit. So we need a feeling. A hope is both a mind state and a feeling state. The two coming together. We need them both. And we are the richer for them. I love how you combine the two. And it kind of goes with this idea that William Sloan Coffin said that hope is really a decision. It is a mind state. Yes. But how much easier it is <laughs> to get to that mind state when you have hopeful emotions when you have strong, strong feelings. Um, you know, as, as you know, it was almost, it was almost uh, two years ago. I, I shared this before that my wife was on the, the nice edge between life and death and every day for five weeks, it could have gone either way. Where she spent five weeks in the, in the ICU, most of the time on a, on a ventilator. But in that time, I got to know nurses, her nurses, really, really well. Nurses are heroes. Uh, in my book, nurses uh, are just heroes. Because I sat, I sat vigil by her bedside, you know, most days, 12 hours a day, every day for five weeks. So I really got to know these nurses really well. And one of the nurses said to me one day, she said, Stephen, as you know, your wife's stats don't look very good today. But if I was a betting person, 
I would bet on the strength of her spirit over her stats any day. You know, and she said to me, you know, I'm going to give her medicine for her body. But you, Stephen, need to hang on to hope. Because if you, if you show up today with hope, that means hope will be present in this room. And I remember so vividly, she said, you know, when hope is present, anything's possible. And the same nurse, she would ask my wife, when we, back to that idea about the emotions and then the emotions and the mind coming together, she would ask my wife, um, what do you love most about your life? What are you most looking forward to when you get out of the hospital? What, what makes you laugh? What, what brings you joy? And she said to me, five weeks in the ICU on a ventilator will defeat the strongest spirit. And we don't want your wife to give up. We want her to fight. So we need to keep reminding her of those things in life that are worth fighting for. I'll never forget that. You know, it reminded me of Nietzsche, who said the person who has a why, you know, that's that strong emotion of of why, a reason for being. He said, the person who has a why can summon, can summon strength they didn't even know they had. So to have that emotion of hope that you're talking about, it seems like, like it's important <laughs> to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I love to ask people, why did you get out of bed today? Most people say their bladder was full and they had to go to the toilet. <laughs> but I think, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's kind of important to have a more compelling reason to get out of bed than a full ladder. I think fear and anxiety will occupy every nook and cranny of our mind and our heart if we give it a chance. We need to create space for hope. We need to create space for those things that, that make life worth living, that those things that are worth fighting for. So what do you think about hope and, and being connected to just having a darn good reason to get out of bed in the morning and to be reminded of those things that are, that are worth fighting for? A lot depends, a lot depends on one little word, but I could sit here all day and feel how terrible things are, but, but I'm going to do something different. I could give up, but I could also think of a new image as you've given in your words. But things can be different if we can have a different image of myself or of the new day. One word, but, but now. Let's see, hear what is happening to us. Because you can give in to everything and miss out on that, the power of one little word, but I'm going to go on. But I'm going to see the world differently. But I have a, a different image of the future. But it's a better day today. And I could be part of that negative world, but I'm choosing. I choose to be different. So the power of one of the tiniest words of the English language, but can do a great, can make a great difference. It strikes me um, how powerful that word is and it seems to be saying, you know, there's more. 
the, the story isn't finished yet. Um, the challenges you face um, aren't the last word. And sometimes when people ask me, well, how would you best def define the divine? How would you best define God? How would you de best define um, that which can't be defined? <laughs> and I often say uh, more. <laughs> There's something more. My all-time favorite, uh, usually when I when I don't have the answer, I go to the simple. And, and my favorite children's story by Dr. Seuss is called um, On Beyond Zebra. And, and, it, and it begins, um, if I can remember right, um, said Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell, my very young friend who was learning to spell. A is for ape. B is for bear, C is for camel, H is for hair. I know them all well from beginning to end. No, I'm getting it wrong, but it, it goes on to say, um, and Z is for D zebra. Well, anyway, but then he says, <laughs> from beginning to end, everyone knows, that's how it goes, from beginning to end. That's when you try to recite a book uh, children's book that you haven't read in, in, in months and months. He says, from beginning to end, everyone knows Z. Z is as far as the alphabet goes. And then it says, but then he almost fell flat on the floor. When I picked up the chalk and drew one letter more, a letter he never dreamed of before. And the places I go and the people I see, I couldn't stop if I stopped at Z. So on beyond zebra, it's high time you were shown that maybe just maybe you don't know all there is to be known. There's more, there's something more. And I love that just when you think Z is as far as the alphabet goes, the story's over, chapter closed, you turn the page, maybe. What did you say? But. But, but. there's another word to come, you see. And as you told the story, you could have inserted but many times. There it is happening, but something else can happen. That's what I've been thinking, but I can think of something different. There you are, but you can do something different. So, but is a very powerful possibility always before us. Yeah. It, it strikes me too of, um, you know, now that at least in the United States, now that the COVID cases are dropping, um, hospitalizations are dropping, more and more people are getting vaccinated. That light at the end of the tunnel no longer feels like a train. <laughs> it actually seems like, well, maybe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So what I'm noticing is that lots of people are starting to say, I can't wait to go back to the way things were. I can't wait to return to normal. And I keep saying, you know, we, get it, we need to change, we need to change our language. There's, there's no going back. There's only going forward. Our question shouldn't be, how in the world can we go back to the way things were? Our question should be, how can we move forward? How can we move forward uh, stronger? as a result of all that we've, all that we've lived through. I remember uh, when my wife was, was released from the hospital, the, we were there a long time. We got to know people pretty well. So the head of the ICU came to wish us well. And the head of this, this specialist hospital said, um, you know, I don't use the word miracle very often, but um, that word is, 
left my tongue when I think of when I think of your case. And she said to us, you will be changed. You will be different as a result of this experience. You, you, you may not even know, it may be quite some time before you know how you'll be different, but the healing will continue. You know, not just healing of the body, but healing of the mind, healing of the heart, healing of the spirit. I just thought there were such powerful words and it just occurred to me that healing, healing isn't returning to what was. Healing is being open to what can be, to what might be. Do you have thoughts about that? Yes, I think it's very powerful. The number of times as you were speaking, you let the little word slip in again, but it will be different. But we will be see a new day. But we thought that was going to happen, but something else happened. So one little word can change everything. Of course, you can change it for the negative, but we're, wondering, we're looking at it from the point of view of switching it over so it gives us a positive, a good feeling, a, a good word for the mind state, a good thought for the emotion, the feeling state. Hope is about feeling good about the future, feeling good about what we can be, feeling good about ourselves. Hope says, but think of another way. Create something different. Create a new word, a new thought, a new way to be. That is so powerful. I just finished a, a book. <laughs> you can tell it's Sunday afternoon and then uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but the, the, <laughs> the author is Ray Hinton. And uh, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with the book called Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Um, it, it just recently was released as a movie. Ray Hinton was the, the, the man on death row that Brian Stevenson worked to get released. So Ray Hinton was arrested for a crime he didn't commit and placed on death row for 26 years for a crime he didn't commit. And then he was exonerated and released. And the book is really powerful because he said, um, once I was released from prison, my body was free, but I wasn't really free until I came to the realization that I have choices, that despair is a choice, bitterness, is a choice, um, but he goes on to say, but hope is a choice, love is a choice. And um, I just found that really powerful. Again, you see, the powerful was in, not only just, not only in the word, but in the feeling that came with it. Yeah. But I can start again. But we can think of this in a different way. But we can now be different. Yeah. In spite of in spite of what's happened. We can be different, but we can be different. But it can be a new day. So the the but experience again and again comes to tell us. Yeah. And how important it is to have the realization that that we can get to that place. I, I think of Viktor Frankl, you know, where, when in Nazi Germany in the concentration camps where he was being tortured. And he said, they can do anything they want with my body. And they are, they're, they're torturing me. But they can't take away my greatest freedom. And that is my capacity. It's your butt here. That is my capacity to choose how I will respond to this. So he goes on to say, I, I, I chose to forgive 
the person torturing me while being tortured because I recognized he was actually the one who was captive. He was operating in a conditioned, brainwashed way with very little freedom. Even though I was held captive, I was the one that was really free because I realized that I had choices and I could choose how I respond to this. Yes, of course, that's, that's tremendous because it says the human spirit or the human mind can be much bigger than we often think it is. Resilience, being able to see something and rise above it or get beyond it. So it's again and again, we've got that word coming, but, but resilience, strength of the human spirit, starting again, but we can do something different. That speaks to me of, of, you know, that resilient spirit that somehow, that somehow we possess within ourselves, a, a creative spirit. I mean, I go back to, I think I shared this the last time, but um, Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created. I mean, my mind was blown when my Hebrew teacher said, it actually doesn't say that. The, the verb created is not created. It actually says in the beginning, God began to create and God continues to create. And we, no, it's poetry. No, I want to be absolutely clear for those listening. This is not a literal story. This is poetry. But the poetry says in the beginning, God began to create, continues to create. and we being a reflection of that creation, we share and possess the same creative spirit. And what I hear in that, it, it's, it's to your, but there's more. What I hear in that is that the story isn't finished yet. That within us is always the possibility of writing new stories. Um, we're not stuck in the story we find ourselves in. Our story, our, our world is not stuck in the story it finds ourselves in. That even that which seems broken and, and, and beyond repair can become renewed. There's another possibility. There's another thought. The creative mind can say, but I'll start again, but I will give it another thought, but we can be together when we thought we we're on our own. So there's always in front of us a new story, a new possibility. We can do what that. Is that uh what is that Japanese art form? Is it, I'm not going to get the pronunciation correct. Is it Kintsugi? Kintsugi? Where uh, pottery is broken and they repair the, the cracks where the pottery is broken with, with uh, flakes of gold so that that which is broken actually not only now is stronger, it's, it's even more beautiful. So imagine if we held that possibility that, that even that which feels broken and beyond repair holds the possibility of being stronger and even more beautiful. And what is more, we are part of the event. Yeah. We are part of the new beginning. We are a participant. We are a co-creator, in fact. Yeah. If we can feel that, that in us, it makes a huge difference. As compared with when we say it's finished, it's over, and I can't do anything about it. But then we say, but hear my butt again, but <laughs> possibility. Can I find it? 
And when I do, perhaps I can rejoice a little bit in the smallest, one of the smallest words in our language can give us a new start. Yeah. But a new day can dawn. But a new possibility is in front of us. So there it is. It can happen. I think, um, I mean, I love what you, I love the word you just use, co-creator. I mean, that, that, that's such a powerful shift from being passive and having life happen to us versus feeling that somehow we can participate in, in, in creating, you know, in creating something new. I mean, I love, you know, I love, again, the poetry in Genesis 1 where, um, where it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then it says there was evening. And then, or you might say, but then yep. but. there was morning one day. Now notice how it's not morning and, and, and night. It starts with there was night, but then there was morning. Just as there is winter, but then there is spring. And maybe there is death in all the forms that we experience death. And beyond that, there is life. Back to my word that I use to define, define the divine. And then there's more. <laughs> the story isn't over. And we want to be part of it. We want to be part of it. We are part of it. It's a gift. If you can get that happening, you're part of it. An enormous gift good you reminded me of being part of it of, of the story of fabio savez in paraguay um incredible story with every day every single day three million pounds of garbage are, are dumped in cartura paraguay and that families exist on the edge of the garbage uh the garbage heap just scrounging for something, hoping to find something that maybe they can sell to buy food. I mean, it's just an ugly place of despair and devastation and drugs. You'd think that's the end of the story. You would think in that kind of place, that kind of despair, there's no but. But Fabio Chavez knew that he was a co-creator. He knew that he possessed that spirit that we all possess. And so he wanted to inspire kids. He wanted to give kids hope. And he himself was a musician. Well, these kids in this slum, they had no instruments. They had no money to buy instruments. But that creative spirit we're talking about, the poetry of Genesis, it's a creative spirit, Genesis 1, something was created out of nothing. That's what we all possess, the capacity to create something out of nothing. So Fabio Chavez started to build and create instruments from the trash. And he taught the kids who lived on the edge of this dump not only how to build their own instruments from trash, from garbage, but he began to teach them how to play those instruments. And it formed what is called the recycled orchestra. And this orchestra is made up entirely of kids in the slums living on the edges of this garbage heap, playing instruments made totally out of garbage. Now, they, they performed for the Pope and a documentary was made uh, called Landfill, Landfill Harmonic, Landfill Harmonic. I just think of um, Fabio Chavez and these kids were able to create something beautiful out of that which would have been the most ugly place 
of despair. And Fabio Suved says, in doing so, these kids who had no hope began to see the beauty and the hope of their own lives. One, one writer spoke of the crucifixion as taking place on the town garbage heap. We tend to dress it up with our Sunday morning clothes without recognizing that perhaps in reality it was a pretty dreadful business as it took place. So it took place on the town garbage heap and out of that garbage heap something new emerged and we're seeing that again and again in human life, in human beings. That out of the trash, out of the heaps of rubbish. New things can emerge. From a crucifixion, various expressions of resurrections can take place. And that's tremendous imagery. We need that, I think we need that imagery. Somewhere there we need to, to reconnect with images of renewal, of rebirth, of resurrection. And it makes a world of difference to who we are and what we can become. Because if we surrender to the other, to our life on the, the town garbage heap, if we surrender to our, our despair and our hopeless state, there's where you can stay. Hmm. Until we say, but, but hope can re-emerge out of that. Some hope can be reborn. Some new life can re-emerge. So the but is again and again the powerful word of a symbol, of an image, of new things. In fact, very much at the heart of the biblical story is where it says, but new things I declare unto you, new things. And it says right after that, can you see it? <laughs> Do you perceive it? Yes. I mean, I love what you, I love what you're saying that, you know, out of that garbage heap, out of that, you know, out of that crucifixion, out of that, which, which is the worst one can imagine, something new emerged. The poet Pablo Neruda said, uh, you can cut all the flowers, but you still can't keep spring com from coming. But I, I, I think not only, not only the imagery, and I think I totally agree with you how important it is to hold that imagery of, of something new emerging, of resurrection. I think it's also important to remember, not only did something new emerge, there was also something that could not be defeated. You know, that there is something, there was a, a resiliency of spirit. I would say, uh, because I'm, I'm American, um, love. <laughs> the love that was present in, in the person of Jesus, regardless of what we think may have happened or didn't happen, you could argue it couldn't be defeated. It couldn't be stopped. And there's something of that, that that each of us possesses. And when we, and when we forget that we possess it, we might look around us and say, "But it's happening. It happens all around us. The tree bursts into bud. The flower blooms when we thought it was dead." The seed in the ground doesn't look very much as if it has any life, but give it time. Oh yeah, give it time. And perhaps new life can emerge, a new plant, a new flower. So there are great, many great images that we can call upon, even when our own spirits are low and flat and depressed. We can listen again and say, but 
But something else is happening around us. If only we might see it, hear it. Yeah. I think one of the best quotes uh, for me that encapsulates your, your but, um, and it's a quote, I must say, um, that I've been holding on, <laughs> I've been holding on tightly for the last little while. It's by Gandhi, where he says, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time they can seem invincible. But in the end, always they fall. Think of it, always, he said. Hanging on the side of uh, the church that I, I lead is a huge, probably, I don't know, 12 foot by 20 foot banner with two words. So we are, we are adjacent to a pretty busy street. So people pass by and the two words are love wins. And if love isn't winning, it just means the story isn't over yet. There's more. Leonard Bernstein said at the time, you know, at the time in, in the sixties when all, when hope seemed lost, uh, one of his closest friends was John F. Kennedy. And after Kennedy's assassination, Bernstein said, this will be our reply to violence and despair. We will make music. We will make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. And perhaps that's our challenge wherever we happen to find ourselves in life. Perhaps this will be our reply when we find ourselves in despair. You can go on, you can go on. We'll, we'll make music more beautiful, beautifully than before and we might be different. We might be different people. We might have a different resilience, a different way of living now because of what's happened. We need not go on with our despair. We need not go on with the, with the bleak picture. We can find a, a, another way. That's a good image too. There could be another way, another way. There's a poet, and I'll finish. I'll finish with this poet. Um, it relates to kind of the language I'm using, I guess, in leadership right now, where I'm talking about within our own church community. We. It's important for us not to think about going back to the way things were. It's being open to how we will be different as a result of this past year, and being open to what new possibilities are in front of us as a result of what we've lived through in the past year. And as poet Nick Askew says, if I can get this right, memory on a Sunday afternoon, but we stand here in strange uncertain days, or perhaps we fall on our knees under the sheer weight of not knowing. We may dream of easier days, but will we hear what is being asked of us in this moment? Will our part be clear? Will your part be clear? And I'm kind of haunted by that. You know, we may dream of easier days. We may dream of the way things were. But will we hear what is being asked of us in this age, in this moment. And will we, we can add to that, and will we recognize it? 
when it comes, because so often it happens, it has been happening. And we didn't see it. Yeah. We didn't hear it. We didn't recognize it. So will we be open to it? Open to the new possibility when all other possibilities look fairly gloomy? Are we open? Will we be ready for the new day? Because that's what our faith says. A new day will, bl will bloom. A new day will come. Will we be ready for it? Will we be able to respond to it? Yeah. So without putting too much emphasis on the requirements on us, just to be there, to receive the gift, to know it is a gift, and to celebrate it. Yeah. Celebrate it fully. That life has been ours for a time. And it was good. In fact, that's what the scripture says in, in, that, in that passage that you gave to us about the creation story. This, God created this and this and this, and behold, it was good. And at the end of the picture, it yeah. said, and it was and it was very good. Very good. I think that's a great story. And I think people forget that on the seventh day, um, it says God rested, but God rested in the goodness. Yes. God took a moment to actually savor, savor the goodness. I don't know why so many people start in Genesis 3. The book starts in Genesis 1, <laughs> where it's all good, very good, and we're invited to, to savor it. I also think of Hebrews 13, very rare for me to just be quoting scripture like this, but here we are, where it just simply says, forget what lies behind. Lean forward to what lies ahead. And I think too, um, back to your butt now, if we can kind of, okay, we can't go back. We may dream of easier days, but there's no going back. Can we lean into the possibilities of today? Again, again, and again, it comes down to those two words, but now. Yeah. But now, what will we do? This has happened, that's happened, that's happened, but now. But now is the possibility of being different, of being stronger, of being more, what do you want to be more of? More loving, more hopeful? Ah, yes. Our task was to be more hopeful. Allow hope to be reborn. But now. Graham, what do you think? What a great place to end. <laughs> we have heard a lot of words about hope. But I think the most important one was that small word, but. B-U-T. But. It kept coming up time and time again. I took the liberty of having a look up the dictionary to, what, how, to see how hope is described. And uh, this is how it is from Oxford. Hope is expectation and desire combined. I think that tells us that hope is a powerful aid to achieving a miracle, if you like, or achieving healing. And I particularly like Stephen using Dr. Zeus again and say there is more because there always is more. We are, we, we are not the beginning or the end. There is always something happening after. No going back, just going forward. And the hope is that we have the choice of hope. We also have the choice of despair. But please choose hope. We started with a story about music and we more or less finished with a story about music. And I think that's great because music gives you time to reflect and to hope about a better future. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Stephen. I think it's been a most enlightening and certainly to me, very enjoyable session. Thank you again.